So we ordered the weather for you to make it nice like this. We, no snow today, all right? We are delighted to have the Secretary of Education here for the country, Ani Duncan. Give him a hand, would you please? <laughs> Mr. Secretary, welcome to UMBC. You've been here now several times. We are determined to make you a retriever. We're very proud of that, we really are. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Secretary, recently in our state we had Maryland Arts Day and a number of educators and elected officials were in Annapolis to celebrate the arts. You're in our new Arts and Humanities building. It, it is no accident that we decided to have the, the day here, this experience, because we wanted to talk a moment about the fact that uh, we do appreciate in our state the significance of the arts in thinking about the education of human beings. And so I'm gonna ask you to applaud the role of the arts in the education of human beings. And, I, and Arnie Duncan and I have talked about that, arts, humanities, social sciences, and I say that on, on, on purpose because so many people think about us in science and engineering and STEAM, but if you think broadly across arts, humanities, social sciences, it is important to talk about broad links across disciplines and to think about, as he and I talk in our commission work, uh, as I work with him on educational excellence issues about pre-K through postdoc education. Give me a hand for the idea of the continuum from pre-K through doctoral education. And the campuses in our area and the University System of Maryland, Towson, UMBC, and all the others, public and private, really do believe in this notion of strong connections across our campuses with K through 12. We have a number of people here today. Our beloved Nancy Grasmick is somewhere. Give her a hand, We're working now at Towson. The new Secretary of Higher Education, one of our own, Jenny Hunter Severe, is somewhere here, wherever Jenny is. Jenny Hunter Severe, give her a hand. Give Jenny a hand. She's here. The Superintendent of Prince George's County, our alum, Kevin Maxwell, is here. Kevin. And our friend, the CEO of Baltimore City Schools, Greg Thornton. Greg is here. Give Greg a hand. Yes. And so, Today we'll get a chance to hear from the Secretary, and, and I want you to think about the notion of partnerships. We are very proud of the work we're doing with places like Lakeland Elementary, the work we have with a lot of professional development schools, a number of educators are in the room from throughout the corridor in the state as we work to prepare teachers. The work we do with our choice program, Mr. Secretary, you've heard about that. We're having a White House summit in the next week or so on choice program for first-time offenders, the work we're doing with our Sherman scholars to prepare math and science teachers in challenging schools, the work that we do as a result of funding from the Department of Education with Upward Bound and with our programs in teacher education, and, and most important, the idea of Project Lead the Way and, and, and infusing engineering and computing into the schools. It was Nancy Grasmick who said to me 25 years ago, let's work to get engineering into the schools somehow. Let's get teachers an opportunity to understand what happens there, from the arts all the way over to engineering, the work that you all give us that allows us to work with history teachers throughout the state to, to rethink how we teach history. And so I, I leave you with this thought to the audience that excellence is never an accident. It is always the result of high intention, sincere effort, and intelligent execution. It represents the wisest of choices among many options. Choice, not chance, determines your destiny. And with that thought, as I talk about excellence, I come to my friend and mentee, Dallas Dance, who serves on the Obama Commission with me. He represents the best of choices. He will introduce our secretary, Dallas Dance. Thank you and good afternoon. First of all, thank you to Dr. Rabowski for those words and help me give him a round of applause for his leadership here at UMBC. I am really honored, I'm truly honored to be here this afternoon to celebrate school progress across our country. And most notably, here in Baltimore County Public Schools, but most recently, we celebrated the fact that nearly 88% of our students graduated in four years from Baltimore County Public Schools. What we noticed is that over the last four years, we've had four years of consecutive gains in our graduation rate. 
our achievement gaps have been declining. We've seen our black-white graduation gap improving and disappearing. We've also seen the fact that student support-centered learning has in fact been working. We're identifying students early on at the ninth grade year, particularly through the fifth, sixth grade transition, but ultimately the eighth and ninth grade transition as well. Dropout prevention committees at every single school are engaging students and families early on to make sure that all of us are a part of the solutions for our schools. But we also have the fact that flexibility has been designed to allow our students to earn credit at nights, on weekends, and during the school day with their original teachers. However, there's much work that needs to be done to continue raising the bar for all students, but also closing the achievement gap. Our goal in Baltimore County Public Schools is quite simply to graduate all of our students globally prepared and globally competitive. We know this must happen through 21st century teaching and learning tools, such as critical thinking, collaboration, problem solving, and communication, all tools outlined in the Baltimore County Public Schools teaching and learning framework. We're extremely appreciative to the support and partnership of Dr. Lillian Lowry, our state superintendent of schools, to support all students with a strong foundation of state assessments and state standards. The Maryland College and Career Readiness Standards are a historic increase in learning experiences and opportunities for young people in English language arts and in mathematics. It focuses all students on preparing for colleges and careers, and Baltimore County Public Schools educators have literally rewritten all of our curricula with our own teachers being at the center of that work from a digital platform. We've had an opportunity to redefine instruction as rigorous, relevant, accessible, and responsive. We will use the Partnership for Assessment for Readiness of College and Careers, PART, to help track student progress toward college and career readiness and design our interventions to make sure all of our students are learning on grade level and not falling behind. We will be supporting this transition through ongoing intensive training for all of our educators and our leaders, and we're grateful for the state investment in high quality early learning that continues with Dr. Lowry's leadership, but also started with Dr. Grasmick's leadership as well. Please help me thank Dr. Grasmick for her leadership for Maryland State Schools over her 20 year tenure. In addition, a special thank you to Dr. Lillian Lowry for her continued work in that initiative as well. Help me thank Dr. Lowry for her current leadership with the Maryland State Department of Education. Now, none of these initiatives expanding pre-K, raising learning expectations, or measuring student progress will be possible without the leadership of our current secretary, Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan. The secretary has prioritized education funds to benefit all students with $500 million national competition for early learning programs, $10 billion to avoid teacher layoffs, $100 billion to fund teaching jobs, state reforms to race to the top, billions of dollars to transform struggling schools, specific targeted interventions in low-performing schools, collaborative efforts through labor and management to improve teaching and learning, and comprehensive efforts to transform the teaching profession. Toward President Obama's goal for highest percentage of college graduates in the world by 2020, the Secretary is improving college access through the Pell Grant Program, reducing student loan burdens for all students, and more transparency through higher education rates of graduation, job placement, and student loan default. As the former CEO of Chicago Public Schools, he's brought the community together to expand learning opportunities and hold schools accountable for student success. And he's raised student performance with graduation rate increases, AP course taking, and the amount of scholarships earned. Not to mention, he's pretty cool as well. Having graduated magna cum laude from Harvard University, or a co-champion, or co-captain, I should say, the basketball team. Please help me welcome the Secretary of Education, Secretary Arnie Duncan. Well, thank you so much. Please give Dallas another round of applause for all of his hard work and leadership. And I just want to say a quick word before I begin about Dr. Rabowski. I'm a, a huge fan of his, and his passion is infectious. As you walk across the campus, it's amazing to see him interact with all the students here. And what I love is he works at every area. He works on the STEM areas, has been an absolute uh, national leader there. The focus on the arts, as he said, these things aren't in conflict. Helping uh, to prepare the next generation of great teachers in STEM and across the board. But the thing that maybe impressed me the most is what he's doing around uh, first-time offenders, and young people need a little, little extra help. So he's amazing on the intellectual, the academic side, recognizes not every child was born of all the opportunities, and some need a second chance, some need a little help. So to be, have that, break, that, that breadth and depth of a commitment to the community is extraordinary. Please give him a big round of applause. <laughs> I, uh, somehow keep coming back to Maryland. So I was with Kevin uh, late last week with the First Lady visiting schools in PG County. Was it Greg just, uh, I don't know how he got here so fast, we moved quick, was it Greg just a few minutes ago at one of his uh, schools, was it Howard County earlier, visited Dallas' schools, 
Um, and it's not a coincidence. I think there's a reason I sort of keep coming back here. And while there's a long way to go, and we know that under Nancy's leadership and others and Lillian's and through a transition governorship now, in many, many ways, Maryland has become a national leader in preparing students for college and careers. And the transition to new standards here that Dallas talked about has only helped to improve results. The state has led the nation in AP success for the last eight years and improved again in 2014. We talk about rigor, that's a huge sign of rigor. As folks talked about, Maryland's four-year cohort graduation rate is at an all-time high of 86%, four points above the 2010 level and well above the national average. Obviously, when graduation rates go up, that means dropout rates are, have fallen, are now at new lows, which is fantastic. And the state is working to expand and improve STEM offerings in all 24 counties. But those are just the numbers and the facts. And we know why those are important. They're just a piece of the story. The progress here and across the country is so much bigger than any test score can, can begin to measure or anything you can capture in numbers. It's about the choices that our students have in their lives. It's about creativity and excitement and becoming a lifelong learner. It's about knowing that they're going to do better than we did. I think that's what every parent wants for their child. My wife and I have two young children at home. And when they come home at the end of the day, what I'm most excited to hear about isn't necessarily their math scores, it's about my son's adventure trying out a flight simulator and his hunger to understand how to calculate takeoff velocity and stall speeds. It's that spark of curiosity. Now, I've talked with thousands and thousands of parents in all 50 states across the country. And while there are obviously some very interesting differences, what I consistently hear are some very clear and common themes wherever I go, wherever I travel. The vast majority of parents want a well-rounded, challenging ex experience for their children that will leave them with a secure future. They want an education for their kids that will engage them in their own learning, allow them to be creative, and to treat them as individuals. They know the world has changed in some fundamental ways, and that the only good jobs are ones that involve not just having knowledge, but being able to apply it, to think creatively. In short, all of our schools have to prepare all of our children for this new world. And the good news is, Schools across the country are doing more of that than ever before. And that's what I want to say to all of you here today. And if I want to leave you one message, I want it to be this. Teachers and principals, community leaders, families, and very importantly, students themselves, have helped to bring about some of the biggest and boldest changes in American education in decades to prepare all of our children for college, careers, and life. These changes include higher standards, better support for teachers, a powerful focus on improving instruction, and underlying all of that, a fundamental conviction that great schools, great principals, and great teachers can and do transform the lives of our children. And it's working. More of our kids are more ready than ever before for a world where, columnist Tom Freeman says, the best jobs won't be ones they apply for, but jobs that they invent, they create themselves. But we all know here we have so much further to go to ensure real opportunity and economic security for the next generation. And we must see these changes through and not turn back the clock. I want to explain quickly why this change was necessary, what, what that change was, and the impact that it's had. Simply put, change was necessary because we live in a new world, one where there just aren't any good options for young people without a great education. That wasn't necessar necessarily true for our parents' generation, but the world is changing fast. Today, without some kind of post-secondary degree or credential, young people have no shot at getting a job that goes somewhere, buying a home, and supporting a family. And for me, this goes way beyond the ability to have a secure middle-class life. Think about what that means for their relationships, their lives, and ultimately, for their dignity. Today, most jobs require at least some college, but only one in 10 kids from the lowest income quartile make it through college. That is simply unacceptable. It's unfair to those hardworking students and their families, and it's harmful to our nation's economic competitiveness. The challenge is obviously greatest for low-income students and minorities, but it runs through every segment of our society. We must work together to increase social mobility. We have to educate our way to a stronger and more vibrant economy. And as the economy has become increasingly global, the harsh, the harsh truth, truth is that a dozen or more countries are out-educating us today. So collectively, we must do better. To meet in unprecedented challenges, educators, 
local and state leaders, and many others joined together to develop unprecedented solutions. Results-driven, common-sense improvements to help ensure that every single child has the opportunity for a high-quality education. States like Maryland, Dallas talked about this, have raised standards to align with real expectations for success in college and careers, and replace old bubble tests with assessments that involve writing and critical thinking skills that are so important. Schools and communities improve support for great teaching. They change their practices to make decisions more closely tied to what students actually need. And I'll quote quickly Justin Minkle, an amazing teacher of the year from Arkansas, who teaches in a rural school there, where teachers and the principal led an incredible change, constantly using data, going from roughly one quarter of students being proficient there in Arkansas in reading to more like three quarters. Justin said, and I quote, one of our big picture visions is for our students is that they go on to live the lives that they dream. We have set these very specific, quantifiable goals, but they are tied to something much bigger and more meaningful. That's the kind of thing I see happening in schools all across our nation and that I hear about in hundreds and hundreds of conversations with educators and parents. And what's the result? As our schools have changed and evolved, so too have outcomes for our young people. For the first time ever, four out of five students are completing high school on time. In fact, just last week, we announced another record high for the nation of high school graduation rates of 81%. Dropout rates are now at historic lows. Black and Hispanic college enrollment is up by more than a million students just since 2008. And just as important, educators have helped to, to put in place the building blocks for much greater change with higher standards, better assessments, and new approaches to innovation. Governors and legislatures, both Democratic and Republican, are making vital new investments in preschool and early childhood education, increasingly recognizing that we can no longer pretend that K-12 public schooling is somehow enough to prepare young people for success. Today, school should mean preschool through a post-secondary degree. What worked for the past 100 years, I think, is insufficient as we move forward. And what's really striking is that in places that have shown the most courage and commitment to these changes, those places have also seen the most progress. And take, for example, the state of Tennessee. Not that long ago, Tennessee had one of the lowest bars in the country for proficiency. Going back to 2007, it was one of only two states to receive an F for its academic standards from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Sadly, for far too long before that there in Tennessee, parents and children have actually been lied to had been told they were on track for success when they weren't even close. But then political leaders, including governors from both parties, worked closely with educators to implement higher standards. And then they stood strong together as students initially scored much lower when held to those higher standards. They knew that student performance hadn't really dropped at all. They were simply being more honest, more truthful. Today, thanks to that honesty and courage and real sense of urgency, Tennessee is the fastest improving state in the nation. When all 50 states are trying to improve every single year, it takes, things, it takes doing things very, very differently to rise to the top of that list. And we should all be focused on improvements and growth. Who is getting better, faster, and what are they doing? Now, I would never say that any of these changes have been easy. Big changes never are. Challenging the status quo, raising the bar is always rocky and always requires a lot of hard work. Teachers and principals have had to totally revamp their practice often with too little support and not enough resources. In too many places, over a number of years, a focus on measurable results morphed into way too much testing and time spent on test prep. And I've been very clear that we need to support states and districts in cutting back on redundant and duplicative and unnecessary tests. But for all the challenges and all the bumps in the road, the bottom line is for so many educators I've spoken with, this, transi this transition has been more than worth the effort. Take another teacher, Andrew Vega, an amazing teacher I visited in Boston at the Orchard Garden School. That school, which was once a school of last resort, is now a school of choice. Andrew had a transition that was really, really rocky at first, but has become a huge opportunity both for him and for his students. In an article that Andrew wrote about his experience, he said, and I quote, he is now a better and happier teacher than he has ever been. On the opposite coast, in Southern California, Myra Laura, teacher there, said in one of our educator roundtables that she pretty much had to learn a new way of approaching teaching, 
less as an instructor and more as a facilitator of learning. I've heard that time and time again, including earlier today. Now it's her students who see that they have to do more work because she says they're not used to having to do that much thinking. Historically, teachers were doing all the thinking for them. What's happening here, fundamentally, is no less than the idea that schools and teachers with the right supports and resources can literally change lives. It's not to say that the conditions of a child's life don't matter. We all know they matter, and they matter tremendously. It's not to say that we don't need to work directly to change those conditions. We have to do that hard work every single day. But it's also absolutely clear that a real focus on improving teaching and learning is having life-transforming results. And I'm proud that we've been able to provide some support for this change. But it started before us, and it will continue long after us. And the heroes in this story will never be bureaucrats who work in Washington. They will always be the teachers and principals, parents, and very importantly, the students themselves who are doing this hard work and challenging themselves to improve every single day. Yet for all the very real progress, it's also absolutely clear that we are not yet doing justice by all of our nation's young people. We're not yet providing them with the opportunity of a great education to every single child and expecting excellence from everyone. Just one generation ago, we were first in the world in college graduation rates. Today, we're 12th. That's not good enough. Today, millions of children start out behind because, simply because their parents couldn't afford preschool. As a nation, we haven't committed to getting them ready to enter kindergarten to be successful academically and socially. We have too many uh, preschoolers, not surprisingly, often our young boys of color, who are being suspended and expelled. We have to challenge that school-to-prison pipeline every single day. A third of our nation's black students don't have access to calculus in high school. How is that fair? And in too many places, it's still possible to take all of the required high school classes and still not be, uh, still not be qualified to go to your public university. Remediation rates across the country, including here in Maryland, are quite frankly far too high. And that's why, that's why it's so important that we see all these changes through. And as we ask so much of schools and educators, we have to make sure that they have the resources they need to be successful. And that's why President Obama has called for billions of dollars in new funds, new investments in our schools. We, we need to ensure that every single child has access to a strong start by making quality preschool ac accessible and affordable for every family who wants that for their child. We need to lift up and strengthen and elevate the teaching profession, improving both pay and training for our hardworking teachers and educators. We need to push back on over-testing and test prep in places where it's taking up too much classroom time and distracting from the real learning that our children need. We need to ensure parents and communities receive good information every single year on students' progress based on the high-quality statewide assessments that Dallas talked about. We need to make sure that college is honestly affordable, and President Obama has, made it, has put forth an extraordinary plan to make community colleges free for hardworking, responsible students. And we need to support innovation by local educators that improves the outcomes for young people. When schools and districts are getting great results for kids, we need to learn from them and scale what is working. How do we do all that? Pretty much everyone agrees it's time to get rid of the No Child Left Behind law and replace it with a much better law. It's long overdue for reauthorization, and there are proposals moving forward in both the House and in the Senate. I believe a new law must double down on progress and expand opportunity for all of our children, but particularly the most vulnerable. But some of my friends on Capitol Hill disagree about taking the steps we think are required to honestly expand opportunity. They even have proposals that would allow cuts in funding for the schools and communities who need the most resources, not the least. That simply makes no sense to me. It would be walking away from the civil rights legacy of the original law, which dates back 50 years to 1965. Both the House and the Senate have offered up, have offered up proposals that would do nothing to expand resources, nothing to expand preschool opportunities, nothing to support innovation. Their ideas would turn back the clock on progress for our children. Their proposals say that the quality of education somehow isn't a national imperative. If the readiness of our young people for the future isn't a national issue, then honestly, I don't know what is. So I really hope that we will ultimately see a bipartisan bill that expands opportunity for all of our nation's children. We live in a time when the differences between the haves and the have-nots are profound 
and deeply, deeply troubling. But we also know that's not the country that we were meant to be. The idea of opportunity for every single child is part of our national conscience. It's part of the fabric that binds all of us together. We are making progress towards that vision. This is huge and it's historic and it would be tragic to somehow turn back the clock now. Thank you so much. We need to move forward and I look forward to our conversation together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is this on? Great, great. First of all, uh, former Congressman Tom McMillan, now Regent, is here. Would you give him a round of applause? He's so, hey, Tom. Very great. Thank you. Stand up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. When you were walking in, I introduced you to some of our students from all over the state and beyond. One of those students was a student, Kevin, from Suitland High School, who's a celloist here and also uh, uh, works in computers. And he works with, I mentioned to the secretary that he works with the ORCIDS program. Some of you know that program with the symphony. It's a great example of, um, of STEAM in that he works with technology and with music. And one of the points he has made to me in working with these inner city children is that he's, he's teaching classical music, teaching them to play an instrument, uh, and, and trying to help them develop the discipline, Mr. Secretary. And, and, and he sees that they have reading challenges and I'm talking with him about the Common Core Standards as he tries to get them to develop the discipline they need in academic achievement. I bring it up because one of the, the challenges we face, as you know, as you talked about, is that particularly for low-income children, children of color, it has to do with reading skills. Uh, and we know that the Common Core Standards are designed to focus on literacy as, a, as an issue. Our state has invested a great deal in this area. The question is this, what can you say about the sustainability and the implementation of Common Core Standards and assessment uh, broadly in the country and, and any advice you would have for school systems as we think about those issues? So I'll go back to the story of Tennessee, which is just a fascinating story for me. And thankfully, Maryland's been way ahead of Tennessee and was not at the bottom there. Mm -hmm. But anyone who thinks that low standards or reducing standards for any children, but particularly for disadvantaged children, that somehow that's doing them a favor, for me that's been one of the most egregious problems in education for far too long, is we've simply had a very low bar. And the goal is not to graduate from high school, the goal is to go on to some form of higher education. And so what states like Maryland have simply done is saying let's have the, the, the bar being can you not just graduate from high school but go to college and not need remedial classes. Mm -hmm. And if the answer to that is yes, and each state is doing this by themselves, that's the right thing to do. But when you are graduating and are woefully inadequately prepared to take the next step on your education journey, you've played by all the rules. Again, you've, been, you've, you've fundamentally been lied to throughout your academic career. So having high college and career ready standards, holding ourselves accountable, if at some places that means you know, for a little period of time, less students are proficient, that's hard for politicians, but that's the truth and we need to be honest with ourselves and make sure young people are ready. Then you get, so that's the standards, having a high bar for me is college and career ready. Then how do you measure that? For me, having annual assessments makes sense. We need to know exactly what students' strengths and weaknesses are, what can teachers do, what can parents do, what can they do to help themselves. And there's a middle ground here. There are lots of places that have done far too much testing, too much test prep, too much teaching to test. We gotta scale back on that. But there are other folks who say, well, walk away from any form of assessment. I can't support that either. But assessing students each year, looking at their growth, looking at the gain, looking at how much they're proving, we need to have that honest, transparent conversation with students themselves, with parents, and with the broader community. Then finally, um, across the nation, we need to look at who is closing the bar. Oh, sorry, who's closing the gap? Who's raising the bar for all students? Where are places breaking through, and what can we learn from them? And so we want to look at absolute performance, but I'm always going to look at growth and gain. Who's getting better faster? And again, that's why the story of Tennessee, not the highest performing state on, a real, on an absolute basis, Maryland's way ahead, but they are the fastest improving state. And what are the other four or five states? Different examples, uh, Hawaii, Minnesota, others, D.C. They're showing rapid growth. And, and what are they doing? And what lessons can we learn from them? You know, I was in Chattanooga last week speaking for a STEAM school for inner city girls and uh, that had been on their state list and had gotten off of that list. These were mainly black girls. 
And what I will say is that they had been able to get off the, the list and to make improvement because of a major push that involved a lot more time, a lot more time on task, uh, well beyond the school day, and an understanding of just how much more effort it takes when children are very far behind, if you get what I'm saying that most people really don't understand what it takes to catch up. And speaking, having taught math 40 years, that, uh, and, and I guess the question is, do we have, do we have uh, the understanding of the resources it will take, either support from the state, from the department, um, to help systems with that after school initiative, with that weekend initiative, with those summer initiatives, to help kids catch up when they start off in the first grade not knowing their names. So let me try and answer okay. that. And, then and I'm trying to be hard, because yeah, it's no, hard. Be, and yeah, then I want to yeah. get to why we have to get out of the catch-up business. Okay. But sort of three things. You yes. talked about time. Yes. And time is a huge deal. Yes. So longer days, yes. longer weeks, yes. longer years, all that is critically important. Yes. I don't know how you catch up if you're not working hard. That's I don't right. know how anyone right. here in this room is successful by right. not putting in the extra effort. And kids that are behind need more of that. I sort of do three T's. First is time. Second one is talent. The students who need the most help need access to the hardest uh, working, the most committed teachers and principals. Yes, yes. And candidly, we don't have enough school districts that at scale are finding those children in communities and helping to encourage. You can't force anyone to go teach any place, but helping to encourage and creating the conditions where the hardest working, the most successful teachers and principals go there. Mm -hmm. Charlotte Mecklenburg is one example that has done this in a pretty interesting uh, way. Third T would be technology, and how can students have access to, to technology 24-7? So if they don't have an AP class at that school, or don't have access to foreign languages, they can be learning. So I think those three pieces, mm -hmm. the dollar figure is not insignificant, mm -hmm. but for me this is an investment rather than expense. But the final thing I just want to keep coming back to mm -hmm. is we have to give every child who needs and wants it access to high quality early learning mm -hmm. opportunities. Mm -hmm. We have to stop playing catch up. It should be about acceleration, mm -hmm. about enrichment, and the fact that so many children, millions of children around this country, start kindergarten a year to 16 months behind mm -hmm. is not fair to them, it's not fair to their families, it's not fair to their teachers, it's not fair to their classmates. Mm -hmm. And it's the best investment we can make in a nation would be to make sure every single child enters kindergarten Stars, and be successful. So ultimately, I want to get people out of the catch-up business, out of the remediation business, into the acceleration business. Well, I think that as a college president, I should say as often as I can, pre-K, the pre-K years are the most critical in a child's future. Give that idea a round of applause, which is the pre-K years. I mean, they really are. And the president, and you have said that. It's very important. It really is. Now, let, me, let me throw out an idea, and I want you to respond, and I want others to think about this. When I look at what happens, not so much at UMBC, but when I look at what, what we're doing around the country in developmental education, <laughs> with my higher education people, and, and Dr. Hunter Spear is here somewhere, um, developmental mathematics really is sixth and seventh grade math, pre-algebra. And the majority of students who start in sixth and seventh grade math don't succeed, do not succeed. This is the challenge for minority children, for low-income kids. And one of the challenges that I see around the country, from Florida to California, except for the best practices by people like Yuri Treisman and others, is that we are, the way we are teaching it today is the way we taught it 40 years ago, that we have not redesigned the approach and it's the typical lecture. What has made the difference for even for us in chemistry and other areas is that we have redesigned courses to get away from the typical lecture, to get to collaboration, use of technology and everything. And I would argue that we need to be putting more money into and resources into changing the culture and rethinking how we teach and learn. Whether it's in middle school or in first year courses across the board, not just in science, but in humanities and other areas. We're doing that at UMBC in writing courses and others. To what extent is the department investing in redesigned courses and teaching and learning delivery? 
Well, first I want to say when I visited some of your classes here, it just blew me away. And you take a minute, I'm done, and sort of maybe walk through for folks who don't know. It is a fundamentally different, frankly, than this setup here. We're up, we're up here lecturing yes. and folks are listening. Yes. That is not what your classrooms That's look right. like. That's exactly right. And I was in an elementary school today with third and fourth and fifth graders. So whether it's there or whether it's you at the yes. higher ed side, yes. it's interesting how common the language is. Yes. It's less stand and deliver. It's much more facilitation. Yes. It's much more students pushing each other. And what's fascinating to hear is teachers saying how much more students are thinking, how much better they're doing. Yes. Yes. Again, students aren't any smarter than they were five or ten years ago. We just as adults didn't give them those opportunities. Yes. We sat here and lectured to them. Yes. And so what, whether it's, again, a third grade math class or freshman year algebra, which is critical, or what you're doing on yes. the developmental side, yes. it's a fundamental sea change. Yes. Easy to talk about. It's hard to do. And it's hard for teachers to let go of control. Yes. It's easy to stand here and lecture. It's another thing to walk through a room of this louder right. with groups of five or six or you know, three or four right. students working together. Right. You have to give up some control. And yes. that's not an easy thing to do. But teachers who are doing that are seeing spectacular results and feeling much better. But maybe take a minute and just sort of walk through what you've done here yeah. because you're not talking about this. Right. You're living it. You're walking the walk. I think it's so important in helping lead the country where we go. Yeah. You know, both NSF and NIH are spending a lot of time on the science of learning as many of you know, to, to what extent is the Department of Education working with those agencies in rethinking how children learn and in incentives, giving incentives to school systems to rethink that approach, and even in the impact of stress on children and, and what we can do to help them. Yeah, so it's one of the things I tried to really hit in the speech is that this focus on innovation, yes. on scaling and sharing best practices and making sure more people have access, I yes. think it's one of the most important things that we can do. Yes. And my real concern in the two bills we see coming out of the House and Senate right now, there's basically no mention of innovation. There's yes. nothing there. So we have put hundreds of millions of dollars behind this at elementary level, middle school level, high school level, yes. college level, a lot to community colleges a lot to outside partners where we're seeing these outside results, but we want to continue to do that, and I'm very worried about that, that ability to invest in innovation, to invest in places that are breaking the mold, yes. helping students learn and be engaged in very different ways. I worry that we may lose that opportunity if this, if this doesn't become much more of a bipartisan effort. So let me give you one spirit of innovation. How many people in the room teach? Great, okay, so let me give the group uh, and, and see who can respond and then and then we'll take a couple of questions to the secretary. Because I had been told not to take questions, but then he is great. He said, if you want to take a couple of questions from the audience, you can. So, so I'm really excited that everybody knows we're good in chess. We were in Final Four in chess. And for a change, our nerdy school was in the Final Four in soccer. Give me a big hand for that. We were in Final Four in soccer. Really good. But what's really exciting is, just learned this week, we made it to the Final Four in game development. Give me a big hand for that. I'm really proud. So that's. So we got these four little students who are going, they're going to be flown to Microsoft, to San Francisco, all right? They're in the top four campuses in the country for the game they developed called Hubotics. And they named the game Hubotics because it's with colored robots. They're lit literally robots of different colors. And it's a fascinating game. And, and I, when they were explaining the game to the president's council, none of us understood it, right? <laughs> And, but what was so amazing to me, the only thought I had was, all these kids would understand this game. And I thought to myself, how many schools are using game development in the learning process? So my question to you, how many teachers right now are using game development in your classrooms to teach your courses? How many? Let me see. There is one. Give him a hand. That's it. Give him a hand. So, Mr. Secretary, let me just ask, to, have we thought about, have we done anything with that right now? Because I mean, it's an interesting, if you think about it, I mean, the kids are doing games. Our generation, people 40 and older are not using games unless you have grandkids, right? But that is such an important part of the education of children right now without our knowing it. To what extent? What, and, and it's a major at the university, by the way. And it's interdisciplinary. It is computing and animation. It's a very serious course of study at UMBC and at most universities now. But I'm not sure we're using Go ahead. So just very quickly, just concrete example. Again, last week I was at Cardoza High School in D.C. Yes. It is a tough inner city school, historically, huge dropout problems. They now, in terms of improvement, are improving the fastest in terms of attendance rates. Okay, again, yes. long way to go, but fastest in D.C. Went to a class where they're all doing app design, yeah, app yeah, development. Yeah, 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 yeah. And these are juniors 
who are pushing so hard they're going to have an AP class next year yes. that never existed before because the students are demanding it. Yes. So this is being funded through one of our Invest in Innovation yes. funds. So again, yes. our money is a small piece of the puzzle, but an amazing teacher. Students are absolutely committed. Some are designing video games. Yes. Others are designing the, their, their award-winning app was focused on increasing attendance in grades for students at school. So a yes. whole wide range from sort of more recreational to they are taking very real data and very real problems and designing an app to help solve it. So amazing creativity, amazing ingenuity, and these are juniors, juniors in high school. And you should, I mean, our Dean of Engineering has a $3 million grant from NSF to work with Baltimore County right now on infusing design into biology and into different areas of science and math right now. And the uh, Bits and Bytes program is another big grant. And then we've got some grants from Education Department of yeah. Education involving the schools. And we need to be doing more of that, especially, let me just say one thing to the teachers. The biggest challenge, Mr. Mr. Secretary, when looking at gender issues is that there's been a 50% decline in the percentage of women majors in computer science in America since the 80s. In the 80s, 36% of all computer science majors were women. Today, it's only 18%. And the reason is that in the 80s and in the 90s, school systems focused on girls and technology. By 2000, we thought we had solved the problem. We stopped putting money into girls and technology. We thought we had solved it. But you do not solve a, a century-long problem in 15 years. You get my point? And so by 2000, we stopped putting money into girls in technology, and so today, only 18% of the majors in America in computer science are women. So the typical woman goes into a classroom, and she sees less than, fewer than two of the 10, every 10 computer science majors is women. And, 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 and literally, the majority of jobs in our country will require some technology. So, I mean, the, the challenge and the question is, how might we go about as a nation reinvesting in this concept of women in technology? Well, let me just take that and broaden it to, I worry about the lack of diversity among our nation's teachers. Yes. This is less yes, around gender, question. but That's around exactly race. Right. And race, yes. So, the shortage, the decline in the number of black teachers. Yeah, and, and Hispanic. Hispanic teachers. And in terms of men, it's less than one in 50. Yes. And you think about our young boys of color, so yes. many who don't have a dad at home to have entire elementary schools with no men. That's exactly right. It's not right. So yes. first, you have to be very, very honest on these that's right. hard, these harsh truths yes. that you raise. Yes. Secondly, we have to track the data. Yes. Third, we have to invest in places that are willing to challenge the status quo and do yes. better. Yes. And while those numbers are true on an absolute basis, there are other places where the universities, women in computer science, is 30, 40, 50, 60 percent. So what are they doing? Yes. What's their strategy? That yes. just doesn't happen. Yes. There's some schools of education that have a real diversity, many that don't. So again, we have to highlight successes. Yeah. We have to challenge the status quo. But again, we have to fund places willing to build upon That's right. and replicate what That's is right. working. But without yeah. honest conversations, yeah. and folks in this nation don't like to talk about yeah. gender, they really don't like to talk about race, yeah. but unless we're willing to put these tough issues on the table, yes. we will never get there. Yeah. And these are, last thing I'll say, as you point out, these are not self-correcting problems. Right. And without a very intentional strategy right. and a clear accountability, yeah. they'll actually get worse, not better. Yes. So these are ones that just don't fix themselves. Yes. If we don't go after this very thoughtfully and strategically and learn from our mistakes and get better, yes. these problems that we're both describing yeah. will get worse, not better. Let me say, I meet with Ani Duncan once every three, three months, one-on-one, -on -one because of my chairing of the Obama Commission on Education and Excellence for African Americans. I don't know a white man that is more honest in discussing issues of race. Give him a hand for his honesty. <laughs> let, let me just ask one final question. We talk a lot about pre-K through higher education. Having been in higher education 40 years, I would say it's the notion of the continuum is still not what it needs to be. We do some things, it does not have the teeth it needs to have. We have, we have some, you know, I see my colleagues here from social work to teacher aid and others, and we have people who give their lives to these things, but they would say, yeah, we do some things, but we can be better. We can be much better than we are. Anybody who is involved in the work knows we can be better than we are. Mr. Secretary, what advice do you have for the state of Maryland and for the country that would encourage universities to do more than we do to be supportive of K through 12. Because 
any of us who work with superintendents and with teachers would have to know it's hard. It's really hard when you look at what K through 12 people do. And let me just give you one, just give you one perspective. When a student comes to me and they're in the classroom, they know how they're supposed to act. Nobody acts up in my classes. It's not, you just don't do it. You don't do it. We just say, get, get off, leave. But when they're in Kevin's classes, they can get on your last nerve. You gotta keep them. That's real. You get what I'm saying? They're teenagers. As my mother would say, the behavior may not be desirable, but it's normal when you're 14, right? <laughs> you get my point? So, I mean, it's much harder for K through 12. And so, I mean, the question is, what would you be advising it as a state we need to do to get universities, and I'm saying us, those of us in the academy, to be more supportive of K through 12? Let me say two things. First of all, for me, the vision can't be K to 12 anymore. It's gotta be pre-K pre at least through, through, through pre-K through 14, and yes, really yes. through 16. Yes, yes, yes. And so we have to change, again, for the past 100 yes. years, K to 12 was sort of enough. Yes. Um, it is not enough today, and it is not gonna be enough going forward. Yes. So whatever we can do, policy-wise, community-wise, state-wise, state -wise, to think about a system that basically guarantees access pre-K through 14, that has to be the vision of where we go. Yes. Um, secondly, it's just so interesting, when you talk about students coming to you at the 6th and 7th grade level in math, um, they're coming from somewhere, and they're often coming from your neighbors, and again, these are sort of these uncomfortable truths and conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, you can do a much better job in developmental ed, and you're doing some breakthrough work there, but at the end of the day, you're sort of catching people downstream <laughs> and trying to save them from drowning. You've got to go upstream, Where, what elementary schools are they coming through, what, what middle schools, what high schools? How are they? These aren't the high school dropouts. These are the high school graduates. How are these high school graduates graduating and coming to you three, four, five, six, sixth grade levels below, you know, behind, uh, below where they need to be? And then what can you do as an institution with those schools, with those principals, with those teachers to train them? It's not an indictment. It's not right. saying it's your fault. But it's like together, these are all our babies. Right. And you can point fingers or you can blame or you can say, this simply isn't fair to them. It's not what you want. How do we train you? How do we help you? Again, we know these are children who have the most challenges and the most right. difficulties at home, but what do we do together so they're not arriving at your door? So if all you're doing is trying to clean up what wasn't happening, mm -hmm. that's a piece of it, but it never gets to the root cause. Mm -hmm. So I challenge you and other folks at the university level to go to your, to, to go to your, root, to, to, to your roots. Go upstream, figure out where the positive <laughs> flow is coming from and where the, the, the challenging flow is coming from and what can you do on a very strategic, intentional basis to help those places where it's simply not getting done and work together but let me, to get radically different Let me use the language outcomes. of my students. Let me keep it real. Yeah. Let me keep it real. The only way we're gonna get higher ed to do much more is when there's an incentive. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. That's just true. I mean, people don't have, I mean, they don't have, I mean, they're already tied up. You get what I'm saying? We, we put money into things we care about. Yeah. You get my point? We've gotta have some incentives you know, we want to, we'll give some, right? But I would argue that we got to find a way of having incentives, just as we can find money to do certain kinds of things, we need incentives to push universities to do even more. That's what I'm saying. No, we, should, saying? we should absolutely be invested yes. at the state and at the local yes, level. Right. That's right. Um, we've had a White House summit where we yeah. brought together higher ed right. with their, you know, K to 12 uh, school, feeder school systems, yes. had some amazing commitments and partnerships That's come right. out of that. But yes, and at the end of the day, it can't be about pointing fingers, That's it can't right. be about laying blame. These are all our children, these That's are right. all our communities. Yes. Yes, we should provide incentives. Yes, we need to come together. Yeah. But it's just a different vision of saying, are these my students when they get to me at 18 or 19 right. or 28? Uh, uh, or are these our students at three and four and I five? Agree. And I it's agree. a different sense of what your, uh, what your realm of possibility we agree. is. We agree. Let's take a couple questions from the audience, please. Who wants to ask? Yes. Hey. Thank you. Um, Tell who you are. Yeah, uh, I'm Nancy Shelton, and um, I'm a professor here in literacy at uh, UMBC. And I hope you can all hear me. I'm usually quite loud. Um, <laughs> And I want to keep it real, and I also want to say that you're right. We can't solve a century-old problem like that. The policies that I see, I work constantly. I am in the classrooms of teachers in Baltimore City. I have been since I became a professor here at UMBC. I'm hand-in-hand -hand with the teachers. I'm working with students. And I don't understand for the life of me how we can cherry-pick and we can say all of these programs, oh yes, they're doing well. But the policies that come out of the reform movement 
The policies that are supported by the people who create the standards, who create the curriculum, literally tie the hands of our teachers. Our teachers who are working with our babies, our teachers, I have watched teachers completely wilt and melt and quit because of the reform policies. The good teachers, you can't possibly know them all. Those of us who have incentive to go into the classrooms because it is our life's work, we see it. And I just wonder, what exactly? You say you want to pull back the testing. You say you want to make things more um, positive and supportive for our teachers. But I want to know exactly what are you going to do to let those teachers reclaim the holistic literacy instruction that they knew and we know. We know how to teach children. But we can't do it when we're worried about all of the reform and all of the accountability that keeps getting laid on top of layer after layer after layer so that the teachers are squeezed like onions and you can't even move. Yeah. And I'm not saying this, the teachers are saying this. Real concerns that I see as I visit schools, but let me just give you two parts of it. Visited an elementary school today in Howard County where you talk about joy in teaching and joy in learning, it was extraordinary. And to see the collaboration of what teachers are doing together, to see the interdepartmental work, see how technology is infused, to see how the arts are infused, see what they're doing cross departments, um, it's amazing. And so, yes, there are many places that are, you know, it's tough and hard and, you know, loss of joy or whatever, um, but there are huge numbers of counterexamples where folks are doing amazing work together. And again, literally this morning, um, uh, extraordinary to see what those teachers are doing. On, and we may disagree on some of the stuff. Um, I said very clearly, I've said it publicly, the president has said it very publicly, there are many places where there's too much testing, too much time teaching the tests, duplicative assessments, um, and so we want to scale back. That's not in either the House or the Senate's bill, to be clear, we want it in there. Um, but there are also others that don't want any assessments, who don't want any measurement, and I'm not going to go there. I think it's so important that we be honest with each other and our students are improving. Are they getting better each year? So I think there's a common sense middle ground, and uh, I'm always going to be for accountability, not carry to an extreme, but not walking away from that. And what I see, whether it's today here or across the country, is where great teaching is leading to great results. And where teachers have that ability, it's not just test scores, it's higher graduation rates, it's lower dropout rates, students are engaged in their own learning. And I see amazing examples of that where teachers and principals in the community are doing fantastic work together. So how we untangle some of the bureaucracy and some of the stuff, we need to challenge it every single day. Um, I'm not saying you're suggesting this, but there are some who suggest we should have no accountability. And I think that's particularly devastating to children and children of color who have been so far behind for decades. We need to know where they're successful. We need to know where they're not. We need to make sure they're improving every single year and truly are, are on track to be successful at the back end. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Morna McDermott. We've met before. I don't know if you remember. The first time in 2011 at the State of Our Schools March, and the second time in 2012 in the United Octet Occupied U.S. Department of Education ever to adults. I represented 50,000. More and more members of the BAC, which is the Teacher Association, 30,000 members and more of United Backup, and another 30,000 members of Save Our Schools. Collectively, we are the voice that rejects the policies coming from your office because we believe they've been harmful as children, disrespectful to educators, and destructive to public schools. There's a raft of research that needs to point out to support this. We refuse to embrace or perpetuate policies which evidence proves have not benefited children, nor teachers, nor public education but instead of being crafted behind closed doors to benefit corporate CEOs, politicians, and the billionaire toys club. So we're here standing here today to say no more to be able to stand by and allow this to happen. And my question is very simple. Are you ready for us? I'm ready for anything. Seriously, I'm <laughs> I don't want to blow through this. I just think, again, we can have some honest disagreements. No one's trying to profit billionaires or whatever you're saying. That's just sort of hyperbole that's not connected to reality. What I am for is for increased high-quality early childhood education. What I am for is for high standards. What I am for is for making college more accessible and more affordable. We can disagree on lots of things, but those fundamental principles, I'm convinced, are leading to better results for children around the country, and I will never apologize for that. Good evening, or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm the secretary. My name is Adia Abishko. I'm a secondary graduate student in the Human Center Computing Program. And um, I've been following uh, Common Core, especially within the Commercial Camp 
narrowing area. I'm, I'm a result of a science study how many schools within Prince George's County. But while, while I was following the town hall, I realized that a lot of the issues came from one misunderstanding, and then um, I guess enough, not enough transparency from the academic level and the state level of what Common Core is. To my understanding, it looks like that their their broad incentive is a broad strategy which should be implemented at the state level. Right, or am I right or wrong? To my understanding. So again, these things do get deflated, and we need to be very, very clear. So common core standards are standards that have been voluntarily adopted by the vast majority of the nation states, including Maryland. And they are trying to make sure students are college and career ready. How you teach those higher standards, curriculum, is obviously a very different subject. So I'm not sure which, which one you're referring to, but both those things, to be clear, should come at the local level. A lot of the issues that the parents were bringing up were at the state level. So there are a lot of backlash from the parents and, and from the students because of this misunderstanding. And they already brought up the fact that they felt that Common Core, because it was um, incentivized, that they were kind of pushing it down and saying, like, wow, to, to a certain extent, I disagree with that. But what are you all doing at the federal level? Because I know it's a fine line when I'm, once again, I'm just graduating student here. What are you all doing at the federal level to ensure um, to that? And to be very clear, that's not even our goal. Our goal is to have high standards in every state. And the simple definition for that is that students don't have to take remedial classes in college. And let me go back again. Maryland has done some fantastic things. If you go back to 2010, 2011, more than half the students in Maryland going to four-year universities had to take remedial classes. More than half. So that's what we're challenging. And so some states have opted to work together, chose to work together with Common Core. Other states are doing their own thing. And frankly, we're agnostic on it. So for me, it's just simply having a high bar, because historically, far too many students who worked hard, who stayed in school, played by the rules, were not prepared for college. Listen, this is the last question. I want to thank the Secretary for being willing to take questions from the audience and for being here. The most important point, you are either professional educators or you're educators, but we're all here for one reason. We care about children. We want to see children learning to read, to think well, to have a good life, to get an education. We'd like them coming to Towson, UMBC, or wherever, getting a right, whether you're a superintendent or an educator. Um, our challenge, our real challenge, is to help those children who are in that bottom group. The children who are privileged, our children are fine. And what I would challenge us all to do is to keep thinking as critically as possible and working together, whether we are working at a university or in a school system, working together to make a difference. Thank you all very much. Thank you.